What's up, Ozones? Welcome to the Ozone, and welcome to the Bobby Knott's Conclusion. This is Tales from the Pizzaplex number 5, and we are going to be reading through the first story in the book today, and that is GGY. I wonder what that might stand for. That's right, this is the one with the description about the kid who uh, has the high scores on the arcade machines, and if you look in Security Breach, the kid with the high scores on the arcade machines is also titled GGY. It probably stands for Gregory, but I don't know, maybe I'm taking this too far. <laughs> maybe I'm thinking ahead too much. Um, but we're gonna see if this story has any relevance to Security Breach whatsoever. You can kind of hear a smile in my voice as I'm speaking because I'm super excited to read through the story. Guys, this one is a big one, um, and by that I mean this book, like everything in this book is pretty big. Um, I actually haven't read the epilogue yet, but uh, we'll get to that. Anyway, uh, the thing I do want to say quickly before we get started is I am very sorry because I have been ill over the past weekend, and I still kind of have a sore throat and stuff, so there might be bits where I'm coughing, I don't know, there might be bits where I'm just cut completely, and then, um, yeah, you know what I mean. Anyway, I, I, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry about that, if I'm, if I'm sounding ill while I'm reading this. But, GGY, let's get started. A barrage of thunder rattled the school's old murky windows, just as Mrs. Soto wrote on the blackboard, Fiction stretches the boundaries of reality. Tony glanced from Mrs. Soto's precise block letters to the plump raindrops that were now pelting the window nearest to Tony's desk in the back row of the musty, high-ceilinged classroom. Tony blinked. No longer interested in anything Mrs. Soto was doing, he put all his attention on the storm. For just an instant, Tony could have sworn he'd seen something moving in the downpour, an elongated, human-sized shape seemed to have slithered through the torrents of water just as the thunder's rumble had faded away. But that, of course, wasn't possible because Mrs. Soto's creative writing class was on the third floor of the 120-year-old limestone school building. The only thing Tony could have seen out in the rain, 45 feet above the ground, was something falling or flying. Tony wished he could get, uh, he could get up and go out and look out the window to see if anything had hit, uh, had hit the ground, but getting out of his seat would have earned him one of Mrs. Soto's dirty looks. He hated those. Letting Mrs. Soto's voice merge with the rain's thrumming rhythm, Tony resigned himself to simply wondering about what he'd seen, and that was okay. Tony liked life's little mysteries. Poking around to find answers to why things happened fascinated him. Tony continued to watch the rain as he pondered what he might have seen. It hadn't been a person, obviously. If a person had fallen through the rain, Tony would have heard the splat even over the sound of the storm. And surely someone would have screamed. Or maybe not. Sometimes bad things happened right under people's noses. Danger lurked everywhere, even in the places you thought were safe. Many of Tony's investigations had taught him that. Thunder boomed again. The whole building shook this time. Two seconds later, Tony saw piercing white tendrils of light streak down in the front of the hills beyond the school's grounds. That was close, he thought. On the heels of the lightning, a tree branch speared through the rain. It shot downward, then disappeared out of view. That must have been what he'd seen, Tony realised. Some of the trees on the school grounds had pale grey bark. He wasn't sure what kind of trees they were. The sudden school had come out of nowhere, one minute, the hundred-foot trees that guarded the school grounds like a stunned line of stern principles had been still, their branches limp and relaxed. The next minute, the trees' branches had begun to whip around, tossed by wind gusts that arrived with no warning. Life was like that, Tony thought. He'd learnt that from his investigations, too. One second, all was well. The next second could bring surprises of the worst kind. Something prodded Tony's shoulder. He gasped as he spun to his right. Space out much? Tony's best friend asked as he leaned across the space between his desk and Tony's. He handed Tony a stack of blue papers. <clears throat> Tony grinned nonchalantly, as if he hadn't nearly just jumped out of his skin. He took one of the pieces of paper. They were assignment sheets, he realised. 
Mrs. Soto colour-coded her handouts. Blue was for writing homework. Tony leaned across the aisle and handed the rest of the assignment sheets to Zoe, the pretty blonde girl who sat in the desk next to his. Uh, Zoe didn't even look at him as she took the stack. She was one of the popular girls in the 7th grade class, several rungs above Tony and his friends on the social ladder. Tony glanced down and read the assignment. He sighed. Another fiction story. In preparation for his goal of becoming an investigative reporter someday, he was only 12, but he believed in planning ahead. Tony had been eager to hone his writing skills in Mrs. Soto's class, his non-fiction writing skills. The class syllabus had said it would be about all aspects of good composition, but so far, Mrs. Soto was focusing only on fiction. Outside, the rain stopped as suddenly as it had started. A shaft of sunlight shot through the wet window, throwing prisms of refracted light across Tony's desk. He put his finger in the pink and yellow streaks that played across the scarred, dark-stained oak. See, he thought, reality was much more interesting than fiction. Now that the rain had stopped, Tony could hear the assignment sheets rustling as everyone in the class read over what they were supposed to do. Several kids started murmuring to one another. Tony could hear his friends whispering next to him. The creative writing classroom was, surprisingly, not particularly creative in its appearance. Although nearly all the other classrooms in the building were decorated with posters or charts, whatever was related to the subject matter being taught in the room, this one was oddly bare. The yellowish plaster walls held nothing but the blackboard at the front of the room, a whiteboard on the inner wall, and a shelf of novels at the back. The 15 desks that were lined up neatly in the middle of the room weren't enough to fill out the vast space, so sound tended to bounce between the bank of windows and the other barren walls. Even the quiet noises seemed amplified. Okay, shush, uh, hush please, Mrs. Soto called out. Tony looked up from the blue paper he held. Mrs. Soto's gaze met his. He smiled at her. She didn't smile back. Although she was one of the younger teachers in the school, Mrs. Soto wasn't one of the friendlier ones. Tall and thin, Mrs. Soto dressed solely in dark brown and tan, and she wore her brown hair in a blunt, chin-length style. The bottom edge of her hair was so straight that it looked sharp, like it could cut her jaw if she moved wrong. Mrs. Soto was a good teacher. Tony had learned a lot from her, even though she didn't assign enough non-fiction. He often wondered, though, why she was so unhappy. He'd like to write a story about that. The goal of this story, Mrs. Soto said when the paper rustling and murmuring died down, is to focus on a mystery while also wrapping it in subplots that seem to have nothing to do with the plot, but are actually essential to it. You'll work in teams of three. You can pick who you work with. If anyone needs help partnering up, let me know. Any questions? She looked out at the class. Tony raised his hand. What if we can find a non-fiction mystery that fits this, uh, that fits that description? He asked. Mrs. Soto shook her head. You can let reality spark your imagination, she said, but I want you to look past the real world. Just as Mrs. Soto finished speaking, the bell rang. It was Friday, and this was the last class of the day. Half the kids in the class were out of their seats before the bell's insistent buzz ended. Tony didn't move. He frowned at the assignment sheet, his mind already starting to toy with ideas for the story. He was going to be the one who would take the lead on it. He always was. As usual, the three amigos. Oh, great and wondrous, great American writer, Tony's best friend asked, pulling Tony's attention from his thoughts. Tony glanced at his friends. We've already picked our num de plums. <laughs> the curly black-haired kid, who Tony had been friends with ever since their mom's across-the-street neighbours had brought them together for a play date when they were four years old, flashed his signature lopsided grin. I'm going to be Boots, he said. Tony shook his head. When his friends had learned the term nom de plume at the start of the school year, they twisted it into nom de plume. I was about to say, nom de plume is like name of something. Is it nom? Yeah, nom is name, I think. Nom de plume. What is plume? I don't know. Uh... <laughs> Since then, they'd insisted on choosing different pen names every time they got a new writing assignment. For the duration of the assignment, they demanded that they had to call one another by the crazy names they picked out. Tony stood and scuffed his, or sorry, stuffed his assignment sheet into his backpack. Why boots? 
he asked. For Puss in Boots. Clever cat. That's me. That's very relevant for today. <laughs> okay, got it, Boots, Tony said. He's going to be Dr. Rabbit, Boots said, pointing at the last of the three amigos. Tony looked at Dr. Rabbit and lifted an eyebrow. Why Dr. Rabbit? You can call me Rap for short. <laughs> I don't know why I gave him that voice, Rap said. He shrugged. The name just came to me. He grinned as he ran a hand through his unruly brown hair. He'd admitted the week before that he cut it himself. It looked it. <laughs> Rab was a relatively new friend, spotting the unfamiliar kid who'd looked a little lost at the start of the school year a couple months before. Tony had introduced himself just to be friendly. He and the new guy had hit it off, and Tony had invited him to work with him and Boots when they'd gotten their first creative writing assignment. Rab pointed a finger gun at Tony. What about you? Tony thought for a second. I'll be Tarbell. Boots grabbed his backpack and started toward the classroom door. Don't tell me, Boots said, looking back over his shoulder. A reporter, right? Tony nodded. He didn't bother to explain that Ida Tarbell was a famous muckraker in the late 19th to, earliest, uh, to early 20th centuries. Neither Boots nor Rab would have cared. Their interest in history was even more non-existent than their interest in current events. As Tony followed Boots and Rab from the classroom, and the three of them started pushing through the throng of kids filling the hallway, Tony wondered, not for the first time, how much longer he and Boots and Rab would be friends. Over the summer, Tony had started feeling a little impatient with his best friend Boots. It felt like Tony was starting to grow up, but his long-term friend was content to stay a little boy. Adding a new friend to the mix had helped a little because it shook things up a bit. Rab was kind of halfway between Boots and Tony. He liked to cut up and goof off, but he also had moments when he said interesting, even deep, things. More than once, Tony had caught Rab with a rigid expression on his face, as if he was contemplating something intense. Tony had a feeling that Rab had layers that Boots would probably never have. Tony had a terrible feeling that he was outgrowing Boots and might soon just want to hang out with Rab. That would be awkward in the extreme. Tony realised he was lagging behind his friends, and he hurried to catch up. Hey, you guys want to get together and start brainstorming ideas for our story? He called out. Boots and Rab turned and looked at Tony. Boots rolled his eyes, and Rab shook his head. The story can wait, Boots said. We were just talking about hitting the arcades at the Pizzaplex. Tony twisted his lips in frustration. But the best creative ideas can't be pushed out, Rab said. They need to sprout from the fertile soil of distraction. Case in point, Tony thought. Rab could definitely be deep. Um, they'd reached the end of the hall and started to make the turn down the side hall that led to their lockers. Boots sidestepped a couple of 8th graders, one of whom deliberately bumped Rab as he passed. Rab's eyes narrowed as he gave the jerk a hard stare. Of course, the guy, a popular kid the, the girls fawned over, didn't even notice. Tony and his friends tended to be invisible to most of the kids in their school. Tony acted like he didn't care, but he was lying to himself. Tony, who loved trying to get to the bottom of life's mysteries, had spent hours attempting to figure out what made a kid popular or not. He'd reached some obvious conclusions. Being a nerd, for example, was not the way to popularity. Neither was being funny looking or having strange habits. Speaking up too much in class was a surefire way not to be popular, so was dressing wrong, but there was something intangible too. There had to be, because Tony and his friends weren't nerds, they had no strange habits, they didn't talk too much in class, and they dressed like everyone else. They also weren't bad looking, or at least Tony didn't think they were. Tony and Boots and Rab were all dark haired, Tony's hair colour was somewhere between Boots jet black and Rab's chocolate brown, and all had pretty regular features. Boots was probably the best looking of the three amigos. The tallest boy in their class, Boots was, uh, was wiry, uh, had deep green eyes, a normal looking nose, a mouth that was usually quirked into a grin, and a square jaw. In contrast to Boots, Rab was one of the smallest boys in their class. He too was skinny, and because the skin was paler than Boots' dusky skin, uh, Rab could appear a little weak and frail. He had really big brown eyes, and those made him look like a wide-eyed little kid sometimes. 
but the rest of his features were fine. Tony had overheard a couple girls say that Rab was cute. Tony's height was somewhere between Boots' tallness and Rab's shortness. Tony figured he was average for his age. Maybe he'd always be average. Tony had dark blue eyes that might have been a little too small and a little too close together, but they weren't weird looking. His nose didn't have anything odd about it, and his mouth, though a touch small, wasn't goofy looking. Maybe his cheeks were a little pudgier than his, than was ideal, and if they were less so, his Aunt Melva... Oh god, my thing's... Oh no, what's happened? Sorry, my thingy glitched. Uh, gl glitched? Glitched. Maybe his cheeks were a little pudgier than was ideal, and if they were less so, his Aunt Melva might not pinch them every time she saw him. But he didn't think of his features... Any of his features were a cause for social exclusion. Earth to Tinkerbell! Tony was jerked to the side. He blinked and realised Boots was dragging him toward their lockers. It's Tarbell, Tony said automatically. Not Tinkerbell. Says you, Boots said. It's going to be Space Cadet if you don't stop standing in the middle of the hall looking like your brain took a vacation. Sorry, Tony said. I was just thinking. That's your problem, Rab said as they reached their lockers. He began spinning the numbers on his lock. You think too much. That's bad for your health. He's right, Boots agreed, flinging his locker door open with a resounding bang. The door bounced back and almost hit him in the face. He didn't seem to notice. Tony stepped over to his locker, whipped through his lock combo, and opened the dented metal door. Unzipping his backpack, Tony swapped out some notebooks for what he needed to take home for the weekend. Come on, come on, Boots said bouncing on his heels like he always did when he was impatient, which was nearly all the time. The Fazcade is waiting. I think we should start brainstorming, Tony said. Boots snorted. The story's not due for two weeks. We've got plenty of time. We'll be able to knock out the story in a few hours, Rab said. Why do, you, why do now when we can put it off until later? Besides, Tinkerbell, <laughs> Boots said, bumping Tony's shoulder. We know you'll get started without us. You always do. Tony sighed and slammed his locker shut. Part of him resented his friends for just assuming he'd do most of the work on their story. Uh, but part of him was relieved. He always got excited about a new writing project. He planned to work on it every day. And he'd have fun doing it. Aww. I, I already feel for Tony. I already feel for him. <laughs> <clears throat> Uh, Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex was exactly as its name advertised. It was mega. Even though Tony wasn't quite as into the place as his friends were, he had to admit the Pizzaplex was ginormous, and every square inch of the entertainment complex was stuffed full of dazzling and fun sights and sounds and experiences. Tony and his buddies had tried every venue in the massive domed compound. They had ridden the high tech roller coaster. Bing, bing, bing! Alarm bells uh, a couple dozen times. Explored the climbing tubes. Ding, ding, ding! <laughs> Played countless rounds on the course at Monty's Gator Golf. Ding, ding, ding! Bowled a bunch of games at Bonnie Bowl. <laughs> Let's go. And raced frequently at Roxy Raceway. They'd also seen so many animatronic stage shows that Tony could pretty much sing the band's song word for word. The best part of the Pizzaplex, though, at least in Tony's opinion, was the largest of the dome's multiple arcades, the Fazcade, a three-story arcade connected with spiral staircases. Build as a disco arcade, the Fazcade was the home of DJ Music Man, an animatronic DJ that spun tunes for the, anim for the arcade's game players and for weird people who used the karaoke rooms on the Fazcade's third floor, which, by the way, does exist in Security Breach. Tony thought anyone who wanted to stand up and sing in front of other people was totally bonkers. Lit with the same amount of over-the-top, multicoloured neon lights and LCDs that radiated throughout the Pizzaplex, the Fazcade had eye-popping purple walls and plush light purple carpet that was patterned with stars and swirls and likenessness uh, of Freddy Fazbear, the animatronic bear that was the linchpin of the Fazbear Empire. This purple backdrop was stuffed full of shiny chrome and painted metal game machines in nearly every colour imaginable. The Fazcade was so iridescent that Tony always felt like he was leaving this real world and entering some kaleidoscopic parallel universe when he stepped into the Fazcade. It wasn't just the sights that transported you to another realm in the massive arcade, it was also the sounds, overlaid with the pulsing bass 
beats, uh, the pulsing bass beats of the tunes that DJ Music Man played, the arcade was an eruption of noise. It was like an auditory multiverse. Layers and layers of sounds were packed together in the Fazcade. Sometimes, because he liked to describe things in his head, to help him be a better writer, Tony tried to pick out every sound he heard in the arcade, but he never felt like he could pass them out. The machine's pings, zings, zips, dings, buzzes, pops, trills and gongs, and the player's shouts, laughter, chatter and whoops converged on one another and just became one compressed din that made Tony's head hurt sometimes. Like today, probably because he would have preferred to kick around ideas for their story assignment instead of playing arcade games, Tony was finding the arcade's racket and barrage of light and movement more annoying than fun. Are you ready for this? After playing Bon Bon Fun Ball, Chica's feeding friendly. Uh, oh god, I messed it up. Let, let me start again. After playing Bon Bon Fun Ball, Chica's feeding frenzy, and Monty's Gator Golf, an arcade game version of the real mini golf course, Tony was bored with the games. Uh, let it be known, he just he just called out Chica's feeding frenzy, which okay isn't in Security Breach, but really. it was supposed to be, and it was supposed to be in the arcade conspiracy. Wink, wink. Uh, this, this, I mean, I guess you could say this story is about an arcade conspiracy. Ooh, maybe Tony was the person who wrote that. Interesting. Tony was bored with the games. Leaving Rab and Boots firing up basketballs in a heated competition at the Puppets Basketball Game Machine. I love that one. Tony started wandering aimlessly through the arcade. Actually, Tony's meandering wasn't exactly aimless. In fact... He had a purpose for strolling up and down every aisle in the Fazcade and watching players at the various games. Tony was in search of an idea for their story. From past experience, Tony knew that he might find what he was looking for if he engaged in a little people watching. Although the games in the Fazcade were creative, all of them Fazbear uh, character themed and fun to play, Tony thought watching the people who played the games was more interesting. Everyone from the littlest kids to the older seniors usually grandmas or grandpas who brought their grandkids to the Pizzaplex, tended to lose themselves when they played arcade games. Caught up in manipulating the game's machine controls, uh, gazes fixed on the screens, mental focus completely captured by the desire to rack up points, people seized caring about real life when they played, kids stopped acting self-consciously, worried, uh, sorry, unworried about what others thought of them when they played, and adults visibly relaxed because they got to set aside their daily problems. Tony was only 12, but was old enough to know that living could be a hard and heavy thing to do. Maybe other 12-year-olds hadn't yet come face to face with how awful life could be, but Tony had. Over the last two years, Tony's dad had gone from being a successful, well-paid accountant for a big corporation to a convicted felon. Accused of embezzling hundreds of thousands of dollars from the company he'd worked for, Tony's dad had denied the charge. A jury, however, hadn't believed him. A group of 12 people had decided that the prosecution's arguments were more convincing than Tony's dad's claims of innocence. Tony's dad was given a sentence of 20 years and a fine that he couldn't possibly pay. Tony had spent the first 11 and a half years of his life living in a nice big house with an even bigger backyard in one of the best neighbourhoods in town. Now he and his mum shared a small, old house, sitting on a not-so-much-bigger-than-the-house scruffy yard just outside town with his grandma, his mum's mum. Instead of looking out his window and seeing green lawns and fancy cars, Tony now looked out his window at his grandma's patch of yellowing grass and a run-down trailer park across the road. Instead of waking to the spurt 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 of automatic sprinkler systems or the laughter of playing kids, Tony woke to the clackety-clack of the early morning train that ran on the tracks just a couple hundred feet behind the house. Of course, it could have been worse. If his grandma hadn't taken him and his mother in, who knows where they may have ended up. His mum hadn't worked since Tony had been born, and got a job as an administrative assistant after his dad went to prison. She made just enough for them to get by. The only reason Tony could afford to go to the Pizzaplex so often now was because he spent most of his afternoons and many of his evenings doing yard work, painting, and minor repairs for retired people in the trailer park and a few others who lived in the older homes sprinkled along the road north and south of his grandma's house. <clears throat> Kids like Boots and Rab, who came from well-off families, 
didn't understand yet what kind of worries and struggles most people had to carry around. Life came easy to kids like Tony's friends and most of his classmates, but Tony knew many kids and most adults got beaten down by life. Even before Tony's dad was arrested, Tony was fascinated by the stuff he heard on the news and saw in the paper that his dad had read from cover to cover every day. Tony had started pretending to be a reporter when he was in second grade. When his parents gave him a digital camera for his birthday in third grade, he had started wandering all over his neighbourhood taking pictures. The pictures had led to stories about neighbourhood events. Painstakingly typing the stories with two fingers, that was before he'd learned to type for real, Tony had used his dad's home office printer to make copies, which he delivered to the front porch of everyone on their street. Crows make off with the neighbourhood girl's favourite doll. Solar panels ruin neighbours' view. Stray dog eats prize tomatoes. Or tomatoes. <laughs> Uh, they, uh, these were just a few examples of his early work. When, Tony, uh, when Tony's obsession with investigative reporting began, his parents had encouraged him. They'd become a little less enthusiastic, though, when Tony had written a story titled How Does Mr. Markham Get So Many Channels Without Cable? After Tony distributed that story around the neighbourhood, a few official-looking men in suits visited the Markham house. The next day... Someone slashed Tony's dad's tyres. <laughs> After that happened, Tony's parents had told him that he couldn't pass out his stories anymore. Maybe you should write fiction, sweetie, his mum had suggested. It's safer. What do you mean? Tony had asked. Tony's dad had sat down with Tony and explained. Writing about real life events can be tricky, son. It's hard to get all the facts, and if you don't get them right, or even if you do, you can cause problems for people. <laughs> oh, trust me, I know. I have a YouTube channel where I talk about FNAF and FNAF theories. No matter if I get something right or if I get something wrong, I'm always going to get freaking comments telling me that I'm wrong. <laughs> it, it does, it goes either way. It, 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 yeah, either way, I, I will be told that I'm wrong. And uh, yeah, I'm sure that's the same for like news reporters and stuff. You have to be com completely right all the time. You can't be biased. Investigative, uh, yeah, investigative journalism is important to our society, but it can be, Tony's dad had frowned, dangerous. Tony didn't get it then. He did now, but he didn't care. Now, more than ever, after what had happened to Tony's dad, Tony wanted to find answers. He wanted to get to the bottom of things. Tony had tried to do that with his dad's situation, but after he'd gone to jail, Tony's dad had told Tony that he had to promise not to look into who he'd really who'd really embezzled the money. Drop it, Tony's dad had said. Promise me you'll drop it. Tony didn't have a choice. He had to promise. And so far, he'd kept his promise. But not being able to find out what had really happened to the money everyone said his dad had stolen had made Tony even more determined to unravel other mysteries when he'd encountered them. He hated unanswered questions. And speaking of unanswered questions, as all his thoughts had wandered, Tony had reached a row of pinball machines. Two pretty teen girls, probably at least two or three years older than Tony, were te uh, tearing it up on two side-by-side -side machines. From their exchange of insults and constant razzing, Tony could tell they were trying to outdo each other's scores. Oh, don't you even! The taller of the two girls, who wore her black hair and a long braid, cried out when her friend's flipper lit up and her point values quadrupled. The other girl, a petite redhead, let out like a bell, uh, let out a bell-like laugh. Catch me if you can! <laughs> she, <laughs> she trilled. Tony's gaze went to the machine's scoreboards, and when it did, something niggled at the back of his brain. He frowned and studied the machine's high scores listings. GGY, he said out loud when he read the initials next to the highest score. GGY, whoever that was, had outscored the other high scorers by millions of points. They had done it on both the machines the girls were playing. Tony returned his attention to the girls' pinball competition. Their faces set in fierce concentration, both girls were masters at the game. Tony liked to think he was pretty good at pinball, but these girls were unbelievable. They were like pinball queens. They both had extraordinary ball control. <laughs> I'm so dirty-minded. 
and they both obviously were familiar with the tilt sensitivity. <laughs> they were familiar with the tilt sensitivity of the game machines. Both girls nudged their machines frequently. <laughs> Stop it, Ozo. Stop it. Uh, both girls nudged their machines frequently and got away with it. Oh, the, the girl... It's been a long weekend, guys. <laughs> the girl with the long braid stood soldier at attention uh, straight in front of her machine. Her mouth was set in a grimace. She had huge teeth and it looked like she was grinding them as her ring and middle fingers fluttered so quickly over the controls that they were almost a blur. The redhead, who had several thousand more points on her machine than the black-haired girl did, stood in a more relaxed stance. She looked like she was leaning casually on the machine as her fingers patted their controls. Although her teeth weren't bared like her friends were, the red-headed... Uh, girl's jaw was tight and the veins of her neck were distended enough that Tony could actually see her quickened pulse. While the silver balls zinged and pinged off the bumpers and shot from flipper to flipper as the girls executed perfect tip passes and bounce passes, the game's lights strobed, throwing up red and orange glows that lit up the girls' faces. Mesmerised, Tony continued to watch the girls uh, but his attention vacillated between their amazing pinball skills to the points racking up on the scoreboard at the back of the machines. The scoring systems on the pinball machines in the Fazcade varied wildly. The same shot in one game might get you 100 points, so a 1 million point score was impressive. In other games you could score 100,000 in one shot. High scores in these games could push to a billion. The two machines the girls were playing had the same scoring systems. They had to, or the girls wouldn't have been able to compete one-on-one -on, -one on separate machines. On these machines, most of the high scores were in the low millions. These girls had already topped 5 million, and their scores were higher than all the, other, uh, than all the others on the high scorer list, all except for GGY. GGY held the top three score spots, for, or top three high score spots on both of these machines, and their scores were over 50 million. Wait. Wait, 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 wait. GGY held the top three high scores spots on both both of these machines, and their scores were all over 50 million millions above the other players. I don't know if that's a mistake. Oh no no no! It's it. There's a comma. It says. Their scores were all over 50 million, which is millions above the other players. I'm sorry about that. I can't read. Uh, Tony turned and looked back along the aisle. He'd just come down. Where had he seen the initials GGY before? Leaving the girls to their competition, Tony retraced his steps, his gaze on the high scores rosters on each game. He found GGY quickly on another pinball machine, a few down from where the girls were playing. Continuing on, Tony scanned the high point rosters on all the game machines as he did a systematic survey of this level of the Fazcade. GGY hadn't played that many games here, but the ones they'd played, they dominated. Whenever GGY was on the high scores roster, their scores blew all the other ones out of the water. Who was this arcade phenom? Or phenom? <laughs> phenom. Uh, and how did they get such high scores? Were they just that good? And if so, how did they do it? Or were they cheating somehow? Tony grinned as he felt a little tickle of excitement. These were the kind of questions that got his creative juices flowing. It was a real life mystery, one Tony intended to solve, and it could be the basis of their story. It didn't matter that it, was all, uh, that it wasn't fiction. All Tony would have to do was change a few details about whatever he discovered, and his investigation could be the meat of their story. The first thing Tony had to do was find GGY, and to find GGY, he had to find out who they were. Surely if GGY had achieved such amazing scores on several machines, someone had seen GGY play. Turning, Tony started retracing his steps back toward the pinball queens, Clearly, they had played at least the two machines they were now using a lot. They, there was a good chance they'd seen GGY play. A couple of rowdy boys careened toward Tony as he turned a corner, and he shook his head as, as the boys each bounced off a nearby arcade machine in their attempt to avoid Tony. 
Both boys wore grey shirts and baseball caps. They looked like little human pinballs, <laughs> Tony thought, grinning. The boys shouted to each other to hurry up, and they tore away. Tony, uh, yeah, Tony continued on, turning out the rest of the noise around him as he contemplated the mysterious GGY and their high scores. Reaching the pinball queens, Tony wondered if he could talk to them while they played. Some arcade game players had no problem chatting while they played. Others were hardcore, and they'd lashed out if he tried to interrupt them mid-game. As Tony approached the girls, he figured he might as well try talking to them. The worst they could do was give him a dirty look or call him a name. He'd gone through worse than that. Being the son of a convicted embezzler had given Tony a pretty thick skin. His dad's case had gotten a lot of media attention. They'd had the press camping out on their front lawn for a while. Tony learned quickly that caring about what someone else thought was a surefire way to be miserable all the time. The pinball queens were still at it. The red-haired girl was no longer in the lead, and now that the black-haired girl had the advantage, her grimace had been replaced by a cocky smirk. Tony decided that the red-haired looked more approachable, so he sidled around to her. Making sure he didn't get too close, no gamer liked to be on hovered over, he waited until she glanced his way. Then he lifted a hand in a casual wave and said, You've got mad skills, mate. <laughs> he didn't say that, mate, he just said you've got mad skills. To be sure the black-haired girl didn't feel left out, he added, Both of you do. You're incredible. The black-haired girl didn't acknowledge Tony, but he noticed that her smirk widened into a smile. The redhead pursed her lips as she manipulated her flipper to perform a, perf a picture-perfect drop catch, slowing the ball's momentum flawlessly to set up her next shot. And her, sh her next shot was a doozy, in a hypnotic series of missile-like streaks. The redhead's ball careened through the pinball machine and her point total scored. Uh, her score shot passed the, the black-haired girl's total and then the redhead was on fire. For the next full minute, Tony stood silently while the redhead dominated the machine and her competition with her friend. When the girl slowed things down with a live catch every bit as good as her drop catch, she looked over at Tony. Are you a stalker? She, sa she asked. You look a little young to be a stalker. Tony smiled. It wasn't the best conversation opener, but at least she hadn't told him to go away. Not a stalker, he said. I'm trying to find out who Gigi Y is, and I thought since you and your friend obviously play a lot, you might have seen them. Gigi Y? The black-haired girl said. She flipped her ball at just the right time, and it caromed into a ricochet that brought her, pro her point total almost even with her friends. Tony pointed at the high scores roster. Gigi Y scores are way higher than anyone else's, he said. You two are the best scorers on these machines, besides Gigi Y. But Gigi Y scores are, like in another reality. The redhead made a face. I never look at the high scores roster. I couldn't care less. All I want to do is beat her. She used her chin to indicate her friend. In your dreams, the black haired girl said. Delusional, are we? The redhead flung, flung back. I don't know why it's so difficult to say redhead. It's just a really weird word. Tony laughed. The redhead flicked another look at him. You're kind of cute, she said. How old are you? Tony flushed. I'm in seventh grade. I'm twelve. The redhead heaved a loud sigh. Too young. We're sophomores. Tony didn't know what to say to that. He decided to ignore it. So, you don't know who Gregory is? Oh, Gigi White? Ah! <laughs> he asked. Uh, the redhead shrugged. No idea. You should ask Axel. Who's Axel? Tony asked. The black-haired girl let out a guffaw. A, B, C, she said. <laughs> oh my, I, even I was confused now. I was like, what is going on? Why is she saying the ABCs? I was like, should I sing it? <laughs> so I started singing A, B, C, and then I realised what's going on. Uh, Baff led by the introduction to the alphabet, Tony said, huh? The redhead used her head to indicate the high scores roster. Axel Brandon Campbell. He's probably up there. Tony looked up at the high scores roster. Sure enough, ABC was a couple lines below the two girls' initials, KXT and CRF. He idly wondered what their initials stood for, but he didn't ask. Hey, um, 
what was I going to say? Oh, I believe this is in security breach. I, I could be wrong by this. This might be something that, like, someone made up one time and, like, shared with me. But I'm pretty sure that ABC is in security breach somewhere. And it might be on a pinball machine. So might want to go back and check. Either way, this is, this is very canon. <laughs> like, this is very much... Uh, shown to be in, in the Mega Pizza Plex. And by the way, if you couldn't tell already, it talked about the climbing tubes. It talked about the other one. What's the other one? The climbing tubes and the. Oh, and the. And Fast Freddy, the roller coaster. And uh, those are only things that appear in Tales from the Pizza Plex. So that is full on confirmation that the Tales from the Pizza Plex, Pizza Plex is the Security Beach Pizza Plex. And I love that. I love it so much. I love how clear, like, clearly defined these stories are. I love that they're just set in the same continuity. It is so nice <laughs> to just be able to breathe with that fact, okay? It is so nice. It is undeniable at this point, I would say. Um, and like, while Phasma Frights is still debatable, I think it's really, really nice that we, we have that for Tails. Anyway. The redhead concentrated on her play for a few seconds, then she said, Axel's in our class, and he's always blathering about how he's on the high scorers rosters on a bunch of games here. He's the one who told us we're on the board on these machines. He'll probably know who GGY is. What does Axel look like? Tony asked. Short, the redhead said. About your height, but he's four years older than you are. Really long face, little mouth, big ears. Where's the stupid hat? The... <laughs> the black-haired girl said. Yeah, her friend agreed. What kind of hat? Tony asked. The redhead shrugged. The kind of hat you wear to fish in. Or at least my dad does. Bucket hat, the black-haired girl said. That's it, the redhead said. Ugly green. Now go away, the black-haired girl said. You're messing with my groove. The redhead snorted. <laughs> like you even have a groove, she flung at her friend. Ha! <laughs> The black-haired girl growled, and the two kept playing. Tony smiled. Thanks, he said. Neither girl acknowledged him. <laughs> Me talking to girls. Um, Tony turned and craned his neck to scan the players within his line of sight. He didn't spot any ugly green bucket hats. Staring down the aisle, Tony's head swiveled right and left as he went. He had something to go on now. How hard would it be to find a frequent player who wore an ugly green hat? There you are! Boots called out. Tony turned. Boots and Rab were strolling toward him. Where have you been? Rab asked. Tony shrugged. I was people watching. Boots made a loud snorting sound. Snore, he said. He punched Tony lightly in the bicep. You really need a better hobby. Tony shrugged again. He didn't want to just tell Boots or Rab about his new investigation. They just rag on him about his curiosity and tell him his idea was dumb. They always thought his real-life investigations were lame. We're hungry, Rab said. Pizza? Tony nodded. Sure. He figured he would come back later to look for Axel. Uh, he didn't want his friends around while he was investigating anyway. Tony had to concentrate to keep a grin off his face as he and his friends strolled out of the Fazcade. He couldn't wait to dive into the GGY mystery. He had a really strong feeling about it, like it was just the tip of an iceberg that was going to knock his socks off. He didn't know why he thought that, but he'd learned to trust his instincts. There was something here, something that he was going to unravel, and it was going to be epic. <laughs>